Hello everyone, if you're here because you watched the last video about a past pawn, then you're going to get yet another knowledge or a pattern likewise of how to create a past pawn. If you face a very strong opponent, it is highly possible that they are not going to hand you the past pawn that easily. That said, there are still going to be some components that you can take advantage of when your opponent presents them. And that can be as specific as your opponent's backward pawns or just some weak squares on your opponent's territory. In the video that I made previously as well, we mentioned a bit about sacrificing our rook in order to get initiative, one of them being pass pawn. This video will cover a little bit more in depth as to how exactly we can go about and create our own bad boys. If necessary, perhaps we'll make a second or third video about this. But as we can already see from the first game, it is already not easy to see how we can create a pass pawn right away. And then with Mikhail Gurevich's next move, which is rook to c8, he's really looking to trade rooks, which Anand does not want to avoid. Well, technically, he can avoid if he plays rook to d1, but in turn, he will compromise the entire c file to black's control, which is not the future world champion style. So Anand did the correct thing, traded off the rook, and after the recapture on c8 with the knight, it does not matter if the recapture is with the bishop, Anand plays pawn to g4. Now, why is the move pawn to g4? Now, it turns out that Anand is not without advantage of himself. He has a big control of the center of the board and also the king's side space. As you can see, the majority of his pieces are all staring on the king's side. That is including the pawn structure as well. And so this pawn g4 move is just to make sure that we actually push pawns to attack on the king's side to create chances, if anything. Next turn, he will then perhaps push with h4, move the knight away, let's say to e1, to g1, and then push with f4 as well. Suddenly, his plan becomes much easier to see. Gurevich continued with pawn to h6, not sure if that is the necessary move to play. I'll perhaps start with knight to e7, knight to b6 to just get my knight developed and see if I can defend that way. But knight to h4, continue with the plan of moving the pawn forward. If anything, looks to jump to this g6 square which is weak. After knight to e7, pawn f4, pawn a6, rook to f1. As we can see, the last three moves have been focused on the king's side right here. f4, knight h4, rook to f1, all has been actually focused on the king's side to actually support the creation of a pass pawn. Gravich continue with bishop to b5. As we can see, just trading off this bishop that is not very active sitting on d7. Instead, look to trade off some of the strongest pieces here on the king's side, which is the bishop on d3 that is aiming on the king's side. Now, Vishen Nan did not care. He placed pawn to f5, still focused on attacking on the king's side, creating past pawn. And after pawn to h5, which is seemingly a good move, trying to break up my pawn chain here with pawn takes on g4 next move, and also lined up my knight with the rook, Anand placed knight to g6, attacking the rook here on h8. And here probably Gurevich continued with a very sensible move and he placed knight to g6. This is in a spirit that if you lack space in general, as you can see black's really cramped, you want to trade off as many pieces as possible. But this move is the one who gives crack in his position. Black forgot that white could have just taken here on f6. And the point is you cannot bring your knight back to e7 because pawn takes on g7 attacking the rook. The rook has to move or else the pawn promotes. The rook moves to g8 but then we have pawn to f6. And in hello, we have two connected pass pawns right here. Walking together, this will be an easy peasy game for white. And so black did not move the knight away. He took this pawn back on f6. But then we have pawn takes g6. We have a new pass pawn in the house. Now technically, it can be stopped by rook to g8, king to e7, king to f7, king to f8. But that's the thing, right? Black always have to waste resource or resources on the menial pawn on g6. While we focus on getting our pieces to infiltrate on their territory. Or to just create another pass pawn. Whatever that is, we can have another plan going on while black is actually trying to defend. Black continues with king to e7, a sensible logical move, but pawn to g5 looks to create a chaos and open up the f file for the rook to actually get in. And so pawn to f5, trying to block the f file, right? Very nice. But here Anon has another plan. He took the bishop on b5, and then after rook to c1, it is clear who is actually infiltrating on the c file. The rook cannot contest that. And so he went king to d6, trying to still hold off the c7 square right here. But I mean here white already has double pass pawn. And the last thing that Nan could do to support this pawn to run down the board is to bring his king closer to where the pass pawn is. It is also worth to know that some players might be tempted to take this pawn here on b5 as this is very weak and perhaps the weakest pawn for our opponent. But after the move such as rook to c5, we can see b6 setting up a trap for the rook. After rook takes b5, we can see king to c6. Yes, we can protect the rook here on b5, but the rook cannot get out and will be technically down a rook right here if the rook is stuck on b5 and can't do anything. And so a good move right here would be getting our king closer to the pass pawn 
And even after rook takes g6 right here in this position, we are then ready to bring our rook here to h3, attacking the pawn on h5, together with this passed pawn on g5 and potentially h2. Anon is going to have easy game, or at least an easy end game, convert this to a win. The rook to g8, rook to h5, rook to c8, we do see g6, just pushing up the pawn to home run. And after rook to c4, rook to g5, rook d4 check, king to e3, rook d4 check, king f2. There is no way to stop this pawn from running. And so here in this position, black resigns. Black resigns because there's no way to get the rook behind the pawn. And the king here is too late in stopping this pawn here on g6. And so there's really nothing that black can do. And he threw in the towel. Do you see how easy the game was up from the middle game to the end game? Sometimes you just got to let nature do its due course and let your opponent blunder instead while you make a serious sane move. And that's the first principle. You've got to create an attack where you're dominant at. The next game features Magnus Carlsen's game against one of the strongest players from Spain. This game, as you'll see, is more like a theme of the opening itself, but I don't see why we can't use this to understand how some people just seem to like getting their pass pawns easily. So as you can see, it's a close Sicilian where it's marked by white trying to attack on the king's side by pushing all this pawn on the king's side, and black trying to attack on the queen's side by playing, let's say, pawn to b5, pawn to b4, and so on, just pushing all his pawns on the queen side as well. Here after a few developments, we do see Vallejo actually attack with pawn to b5 first. But Menno said, okay, I have some time, let's just play bishop to h6. And Vallejo, surprisingly, recaptured bishop on h6 and let the queen land on h6. Now it is clear who is slightly better in the opening, with the queen slicing off, the king's castling right, and also just controlling some key square around the king's side. Now in a situation where you have already given up your dark square bishop, you want to actually move your pawn to control the dark squared complex to take over the duties of the dark squared bishop they've just given up. Now Vallejo did knight to d4, the same idea after knight to d4 here, he plays pawn to e5, now controlling the whole dark squared complex around the center and also the king's side. Carson continues with castle on the king's side, and after knight to g8, queen to d2, knight to e7, kicking the queen away, bring a knight to e7, preparing the castle on the king's side, Magnus plays pawn to f4. As I've discussed before, we've got to push the pawn to create a passed pawn. And so Magnus did just that. Vallejo castle left the pawn to g4, pawn to f6. We can see that Magnus Carlsen has spent the last few moves trying to push pawns, while Vallejo is actually trying to untangle himself, trying to castle, and try to bring his pieces to the best square possible. And so really I think that the bishop capturing on h6 is a big mistake from Vallejo. But in any case, it seems like Vallejo can defend if he finds the most precise defense right here, but of course, white has the easier play. Carson continued with rook to f2, and after knight to c6, rook to f1. The idea is very, very simple, as to get every pieces and every army that is possible to support the push of the pawn to g5, to f5, to h4, and see if we can create a pass pawn, right? Simple as that. The second principle is really to get your own pieces supporting your pass pawn, or to support your pawn from running down the board, while actually trying to get your opponent's pieces off the board. So Magnus Carlsen's 10th move here, which is bishop to h6, is already in the spirit of taking that bishop on g7 out. So black has one less defender to defend the king's side pawn from running. And up until this move on move 19, Magnus Carlsen is still trying to follow that principle or the same rule, so to speak, to always support your pawn if you want to create a passed pawn. Vallejo continued a very much desperado move. He plays queen to a5, hoping to get the queen traded off so that the pawn push on the king's side means nothing. But Magnus of course doesn't trade the queen, plays pawn to c3, and Vallejo continues with queen takes a2, hoping to return to the king's side as quickly as possible to hold the fort. This position is kind of too late for Vallejo though. After pawn to g5, Vallejo took, but then Magnus doesn't capture back, he plays pawn to f5, and suddenly we have one pass pawn on f5. The queen comes back to f7, hoping to actually just defend, but after pawn to d4, we can't even take back on d4 because of pawn to e5. And suddenly if you take back on e5, we can play pawn takes g6. The rook is releasing the attack on the queen. And if not pawn takes g6, we can just play knight to g3, maintaining the pressure on the center or on the king's side. Vallejo chose not to take on d4 and play rook to e8. But this is also dead for him because after knight d4 and the exchange here on d4, we play pawn to f6. Vallejo continues with a few moves, but it is evident that this pawn here on king's side is really unstoppable. And in this position, he went on to resign the game indeed. I mean, if you could win games within 29 moves, following just two principles, I think that would be a pretty good deal to begin with. The next principle might come difficult to swallow, but essentially to create a barrage of passed pawn, you have to be prepared to give up a piece or two, 
I'd like to make sure to give up a minor piece for at least two pawns, but ideally three pawns is the usual guarantee that you have a strong compensation because your opponent is just going to give up a piece again for that two pawns, but with three pawns, it's just going to be more difficult to stop. For example, this game played by younger Caruana and Giri proceeded in a way that leads to Caruana having a queen side space and Anish having a grass on the light squares with his pawns on the queen side. It is then clear that Caruana is trying to control the dark squares complex on the center of the board and on the queen side. As the game continues, we see both sides just trying to control one color complex as much as possible. And we got into this position where white plays queen to e1 and basically has all his pieces lined up on the queen side. As you can see, the bishop here, the double bishop pair, are all aiming at the queen side. The knights, two knights are also aiming at the queen side. And then the queen on e1, also attacking the queen side. This is also following the first principle that we discussed earlier in this video, which is directing all your pieces on the side where you are stronger at. Caruana is strong on the queen side, and therefore you see this maneuver. And also something that is worth noting is that black now has a weak pawn on c6, that is basically supporting all this pawn on the queen side. And so if Caruana can figure out a plan to actually take down that pawn, it could be a much better prospect for him down the road. Giri continued with knight to e4, trying to then trade off these active pieces here that might actually target the queen side. And after the trade here, and pawn to f6 as advertised, pause the video to see what Caruana played to blast open his queen side, and also a chain of connected passed pawns. I'll give you a couple of seconds. Caruana played bishop takes on a5, a move that seemingly just throw away your bishop. But the point is, you can't take with the queen because of course the knight here takes the pawn on c6, and you're basically down a piece for two pawns. You have two passed pawns on the queen side, and this pawn on b5 is actually going to fall very soon. And let's say if you take with the rook, right? Then there's also knight takes c6 anyway. Because the point is you cannot take because the rook's hanging. And you'll have two pawns and a piece for a rook, which is a very good deal. And again, this pawn on b5 is just going to fall. Giri continued with rook to a8, but after bishop to b5, it is clear that white here has four passed pawns on the queen's side. And it does not take too much detail for Caruana to win this very much easy game as he marched up all the pawn here on the queen's side to promotion, while actually trying to target the weakness on the king's side right here. And a few moves after black has lost all his pawns for practically nothing in this position, Giri resigned the game. Yeah, I mean, he resigned because he's just down about 5 pawns in this position, if I count correctly. Not to mention this pawn is going to promote, with bishop to c6, maybe rook to b8. In this position, neither did Anish see why he should continue, and he just resigned. The last principle in the list is also covered in a previous video about second exchange. So I won't really go into detail, but what is important is sometimes second exchange is good stuff because it's expedite the process of a pass pawn generation. In this position, for example, black can actually play pawn to f5, knight to h6 to actually clamp down the light squares as we can see here. Both are winning move to, let's say, maintain an advantage, a fair amount of advantage, I will say. And in general, it's an easy move to find because once you have a control on one color complex, you just bring all your pieces to control more of it. The Trojans screw all of that and place rook to c4, sacrifice in exchange. Idea is simple actually, if you take my rook here, I have two pawn spawns on the queen side that's going to roll. But if you don't take as what Boris Spassky continued, you might find yourself um, actually just lacking a lot of spaces because black's just controlling all the light squares here on the king's side, on the center, and perhaps later on on the queen's side as well. And few moves later, we do see white having no choice but to take the rook away for all the problems that he has right now. And with this, black has a beautiful two pass pawn right here that perhaps why is just going to sacrifice his piece for later on. Tigran continues with queen to h3, and as you can see, no matter what Spassky did, it did not matter. Petrosian is already inside the light squares, already inside the king side territory. And with this, he's just trying to push all the queen side pawns to promotion. And just about a couple of spiteful moves later, we do see that white does not have enough, red does not have enough, black has two queens, and in this position, resign the game. And so those are three to four principles on how to actually take advantage on your opponent's weaknesses to generate a pass pawn for yourself. Hopefully with this video, I can shape your thinking a little bit on the so-called even games, and I hope that you can actually have fun in creating your own pass pawn in your games later on. Now, as usual, if you like this video, please leave a like button, and I'll appreciate it a lot. Otherwise, thanks for watching. See you soon.